Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in for the call today. Um, uh, my name is Raid Sipur, and uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Nikun Shaunsi from Princeton CS with Sanjeev Arora's group. And today he will be presenting his uh, latest work on mathematical exploration of why language models help solve downstream tasks. Um, I think it's very interesting, um, especially in the current zeitgeist of ML and uh, natural language processing with GPT-3 and Bartologies, that where there's a race for uh, training increasingly larger language models for superior downstream task uh, performance, that we uh, explore, question, and understand the theoretical and principled reasons of why these language models help solve downstream tasks. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, talk. And uh, an interesting tidbit about Nikunj outside academia is that he's a phenomenal cricket player and a fierce fast bowler. And uh, I've had the, I was really lucky to play on his side and not against him. All right, uh, thanks. And Nikunj, uh, without further ado, take it away, please. Yeah, thank you, Rai, for the very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and just as a quick uh, pointer, Rai himself was, is a pretty good cricketer. And I am really fortunate to be here on the same team. Um, but yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nikun Samshi. Uh, and as Rai said, I'm from Princeton University, advised by Sanjeev Arora. And today I'll be presenting our recent work on a mathematical exploration for why language models can help for downstream tasks. And this is joint work with Radhika Maladi and Sanjeev Arora, both from Princeton University. So while this is a mathematical exploration, uh, I'm going to try to keep it as less technical as possible. And the goal is to mainly cover the uh, high level intuitions and uh, also give a flavor of the kind of results that one can hope to show, or at least the ones that we show. And also uh, feel free to stop me at any point to ask any questions, uh, either by unmuting and uh, unmuting yourself and speaking or by typing it out in the chat. Uh, I'll try to take up the questions at any natural break that comes up in the talk. I'll also give a few pauses to ask questions. Okay, so I'll move forward now. Um, so what are language models? Uh, in the simplest terms, you can think of language models as next word predictors. In other words, if you're given a context that is a piece of text, S, you want to predict what word W can follow it. For example, if you have the context, I went to the cafe and ordered a, a language model would like to predict what the next word could be. Uh, after this context. And it does so by outputting a distribution P sub S. And this distribution is a distribution over, let's say the, set, the vocabulary set that you have. It's a distribution over all words in your vocabulary. And it could assign high probabilities to words like latte, uh, latte or cappuccino that are more likely to follow this context as opposed to something like dolphin. And such language models are typically trained uh, by using a very large text corpus, let's say all of Wikipedia or maybe even larger, the scrape of the internet. And this distribution is trained to minimize across entropy objectives. So this is a, a very standard objective in machine learning that you might, you, you all have probably encountered at some point. Uh, and in the context of language modeling, the goal of this objective is to minimize this loss where you take an expectation over a pair of S comma W. So S is a context here and W is the next word after the, after the context. And these SW pairs are selected from, let's say the, the, the unlabeled corpus that you have. And then as you can see here, in order to minimize this objective, you would want your language model to maximize the probability of the actual word that was seen after the context, uh, which kind of makes sense because this is the goal. And language models, especially recently, have found a lot of use in uh, solving a bunch of downstream tasks. Apart from the obvious task of being able to generate text uh, word by word, it can also ta solve other tasks like question answering or machine translation, uh, and also classification of sentences, and many more. Uh, pardon my French here. Uh, I just, I, I, I must admit, I did use Google Translate for this, so uh, yeah. So, so, so I'll just give a brief outline of a very, very, very broad overview of how language models are used for downstream tasks. Uh, it's typically done in two stages. In the first stage, you pre-train a language model by using large amounts of unlabeled data. For example, you can think of all of Wikipedia, let's say. And in the second stage, you use the language model for a downstream task. 
and you can do so in multiple ways. Uh, th- there have been multiple ways that have been used in the literature. So for one, you can use the pre-trained language model as an initialization for a model that will be further fine-tuned when given access to labeled data. You could also extract some features from the language models. For example, you could extract the output features from different layers of a neural network that is present inside the language model. And you can fix these features and then learn a linear or a non-linear classifier on top of this, again, with access to label data for the downstream task. Uh, more recently, uh, language models have found use in uh, few shot and zero shot tasks as well, uh, where they explicitly, where you can explicitly exploit the text generation property of language models to solve a bunch of tasks. Uh, and uh, there has been an extensive study uh, using the GPT-X language model series from the OpenAI group. And the overall theme here is that given uh, given a lot of data in the first stage, you are able to learn a very complicated model, maybe a very large neural network. And this enables you to reduce the requirement for label data in the second stage. So one of the big benefits that uh, pre-training a language model like this can help you is to reduce the amount of label data that you need in a downstream task. And our goal in this work is to try to understand why language models work, try to come up with some theory for language models. And there are a lot of strong intu- intuitions for why language models can help with downstream tasks. Uh, and one of the biggest arguments could be that next word prediction in language is not a very easy task. It's, it, it does require some level of language understanding. And for a language model to be able to do that, it must understand language. Uh, apart from that, there are other factors like the design choices. For example, the specific model architecture that you use, maybe it's a recurrent neural network or a transformer architecture and the algorithms that are used, like gradient descent, uh, these also somehow enable better transfer of performance from language modeling to downstream tasks. Uh, though there's no theoretical understanding, uh, concrete understanding for this. Um, and actually, what, what, do we, what would we even want a theory for language models to do? Uh, for example, we would definitely want to at least try to ground the existing intuitions for why language models help into some kind of mathematical statements. And then hopefully if you stare at those mathematical statements, manipulate them using linear algebra or calculus and hope to get some new insights uh, that perhaps we did not have or at least did not very concretely know uh, before that. And these insights can hopefully help guide algorithmic design and improvements to existing models. In fact, there has been some recent work on the theory for self-supervised learning algorithms, like contrastive learning, if you're familiar with them, and, and some others. And the motivation for self-supervised learning is similar. It's to use a lot of unlabeled data to learn some kind of useful model, which can, for, which can then be used for downstream tasks and reduce the sample complexity or reduce the amount of labeled data required. Uh, and language models are also a kind of self-supervised learning if you think of it. So self-supervised learning will take unlabeled data create some pseudo tasks out of this unlabeled data. In this case, it is to predict the next word given the text before it, and then uh, learn a model using a particular objective function. Our approach to understanding language models is in some ways related, uh, but the fundamental approaches that we use are quite different here. But uh, if you're interested, I would also recommend you to look at uh, this area as well. Okay, so I'll just, uh, briefly describe the, the precise setting that we would be looking at for the theoretical analysis, uh, just to ground things. So in this work, we are mostly interested in the role of next word prediction. That is, we are, we are interested in understanding why should predicting the next word intrinsically help with downstream tasks. While there are other factors, perhaps important factors like the inductive biases of uh, the model architecture that is used, let's say a transformer architecture or algorithms like gradient descent that are used. Precisely understanding the role of these inductive bias is already hard, is a very difficult problem given our current tools for the theory of deep learning. So we're going to restrict our attention to the role of next word prediction and try to distill away the fa- uh, other factors from this. Next, for downstream tasks, as a first cut analysis, we are only going to look at classification tasks. And we find that this already gives us interesting insight, insights. Of course, we would hope that uh, maybe some of the insights or some of the tools here can later be used uh, to try to understand the success on other 
arguably more interesting NLP tasks like question answering, part of speech typing, machine translation, etc. But for now, we're going to focus on classification tasks. And we're going to take a representation learning perspective here. Uh, so by that, I mean that we're going to use a language model to extract some features out of it. And for a downstream classification task, we're going to fix these features and use the label data to learn a linear classifier on top of these features. And in fact, we'll see later that this already does well, quite well in practice for, for classification tasks of interest or for a lot of them. Additionally, learning just the linear classifier on top of the features also provides other nice properties like sample efficiency because it just depends on the dimensionality of the representation uh, and also in some sense interpretability. Finding these features for a downstream task does indeed help. However, again, just like the inductive biases, it's hard to quantify the benefits of this using a current tooth of deep learning. Uh, so this is going to be the precise setting that we're going to be interested in. And just to summarize, so we're going to use a language model to extract some d-dimensional features. So d can be thought as a low-dimensional feature, let's say something like 1,000. And then this feature map is subsequently going to be used for a downstream task. So given a task of, let's say, sentiment classification of movie reviews, you can first take all sentences or all movie reviews, embed them into some into the d-dimensional vector space, and then just the, learn a linear classifier trying to separate uh, the two classes. In this case, it's the positive and mo negative movie reviews. And the question that we wish to answer is, why can language models that do well on the cross-entropy objective that I mentioned earlier learn features that are useful for classification tasks by using a linear classifier? And in this work, uh, the, the key contributions towards answering this question are the following. We first have this observed this key, key idea that classification tasks, a lot of them, can be rephrased as sentence completion problems. And once, once we do that, it makes sense to try to predict the next word, or at least you can see why the next word prediction pre-training task can be a meaningful task. Next, what we do is formalize this idea into a mathematical statement. And uh, if we do this the right way, you can actually show a precise bound for language models. Or in other words, you can show that an epsilon optimal language model in the cross entropy objective can learn features that can linearly solve such tasks up to an editive error of square root epsilon that it will incur due to the suboptimality. Sub -optimality. And further, we try to verify as many as possible uh, theoretical insights and some of the mild assumptions that we would use in our analysis. And we actually also can design a new objective function based on these theoretical insights, and I'll get into that later. Okay, so the outline for the next rest of the talk is going to be, I'm going, first going to summarize uh, the setting for language modeling and the objective function use and the parameterization that's common in practice, and then describe the downstream classification tasks and how they can be reformulated as sentence completion problems. And then, We'll go ahead and show the formal guarantees uh, that I described earlier for epsilon onto a language models and followed by some discussions. So I'll just pause you for some time to see if there are any questions about the setup. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll move ahead with uh, describing language modeling. Okay, as I said earlier, you're given a context to a, lang a language model and it outputs a distribution over the words that could follow the given context. So for the rest of the talk, you can think of this distribution P sub S as a vector of with V dimensions, where V is the size of the vocabulary that you have. That is, it's the number of words that you are interested in. And each coordinate corresponds to the probability of a particular word. So coordinates are indexed by words. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, the goal is to try to learn this distribution to be as close as possible to the true, true distribution, P star of S. So to get a sense of P star of S, uh, first of all, it's clear that for a given context, there is no one right answer for what word could follow it. There could be multiple right answers. And this uncertainty in what the answer could be is captured through, this, this, through the true distribution P star of S over the words, where this distribution can be the distribution that uh, it's the all possible words that can occur with some different probabilities in the distribution of the text corpus that you're using to train the language model. And now, P star of S is not known, but what you want to do is minimize an objective function so that PS is perhaps as close as possible to P star S. And you do so using the cross-entropy objective. 
that I described earlier. And one really nice property and a very no, well-known property of, cross, of the cross entropy objective is that the minimizer of this is in fact exactly learning the true distribution P star. So the only way you can minimize the cross entropy objective is for P of S to be equal to P star of S for the true distributions to be exactly the same. And while this is folklore, I'll just give a one line uh, proof of why this is the case, or at least a sketch. That's because you can actually rewrite the cross entropy objective, cross entropy loss as a KL divergence between P star of S and PS plus a constant term that only depends on the true distribution and it's not part of the language model. And it's actually an expectation over the set of contexts that you're going to see. And from this, you can see that the only way to minimize this is to minimize the KL divergence between P star of S and P of S for all contexts S. And you can, the only way that happens if, is if the distributions are the same. That's, the, that's when KL divergence is minimized. So this, so it, does, it makes sense to use the cross entropy objective. However, in practice, you do not, uh, a language model does not actually learn an arbitrary distribution piece of this. Uh, and it is in fact uh, parameterized using neural networks and a softmax. And I'll just go into the uh, details for how this is done. So you can basically abstract away most language models, especially the more recent ones, into the following abstraction, where given the context S, you first, let's say, use a large neural network like a recurrent neural network or a transformer architecture. And you embed it into a d-dimensional feature, f of s. This is just a vector in Rd. We're going to refer to this as features. Furthermore, uh, you have a matrix of word embeddings that follows these features, which is of dimension d times v. So d here, as I said, was a dimension of the features, and v here is a number of words that you have. So you can think of V as being of the order of, let's say, 50 to 100,000. That's the number of words or tokens that you're interested in. And D is of the order of thousands. So it's at least an order of magnitude smaller than the number of words. And this word embedding matrix phi is basically, if you stack, if, if you look at any column of this word embedding, it's a D-dimensional vector that corresponds to the embedding for that particular word. And now you, you multiply this matrix phi and F and the feature F, and you get the logits. Uh, as you generally do in even in classification. And then you take a softmax over these logics to get a softmax distribution, P of F of S. And again, this is a vector of V dimensions. And uh, this is the vector that you get after taking the softmax over the logics using the features F of S. So again, uh, as before, the goal is to try to minimize the cross entropy objective, but now for the softmax distribution. And now an interesting question arises. So given that we parameterize it using d-dimensional features, especially we are interested in, where d, in the case where d is much less than v, the vocabulary size, is it still possible to learn the true distribution speech star exactly? Even if we exactly minimize the cross entropy objective, is it possible to do so? And uh, it turns out that you may not always be able to do it. Although what you can guarantee is, if you fix the word embedding matrix, uh, so I forgot to mention this earlier. You are not only minimized in, in language modeling, you not just minimize over the feature map, but you also minimize over the word embeddings. You learn word embeddings. But for this talk, I'm going to assume that the word embedding matrix is fixed. Uh, and uh, you can either justify this by saying that, okay, I use some pre-trained word embeddings, like something like love or word to it. Or you first learn the word embedding matrix and F simultaneously, and then just fix the word embeddings and continue learning the feature map. So what you can show is for a fixed word embedding matrix, the feature map F star that minimizes the cross entropy objective will satisfy the following in, for following equality, which is phi, phi times P of F star equals phi times P star of S for every context S. So in other words, you're not necessarily guaranteed that P of F star of S is equal to P star of S, but you're only guaranteed to learn P star on the D, on a D dimensional subspace. And the subspace is determined by the, the span of the rows of the word embedding matrix phi. Okay. So phi times P star and phi times P of S here are D dimensional vectors. So you don't exactly learn P of S equals P star of S in the V dimensional space, but at least you're learning them to be e equal in some D particular directions. And actually the proof for this is also not that complicated. Uh, it just uses the first order optimality condition. So if you look at the gradient of the cross entropy objective, which is the same as the gradient of the KL objective, 
and set it to zero, you can actually show this. So although not that difficult to show, this is actually a very interesting insight that the cross entropy objective, even though you don't exactly learn PSAR, you can at least learn it on a subspace and it will learn it in a linear way. And this insight is something that we're going to be exploiting later in our results. So I'm just going to pause here to see if there are any questions about uh, the cross entropy objective and the softmax parameterization. Uh, Nikuj, I had a quick question. So here, uh, S is the, the set of uh, context, right? So uh, the optimal solution, this is uh, where uh, the assumption is that uh, there's no like um, like out of domain or outside S like uh, generalization property. It's it's within the fixed set of S, right? Okay. Right. That's correct. So this this uh, the the statement about the optimal solution, perhaps I should have added, is for all context S that you see in your language modeling distribution. Right. So S is just a particular context. It's like I went to the cafe and ordered, a, and you have multiple such. You have a distribution of this context. Thanks for the question. Uh, any more questions about the softmax result? Uh, yeah, so I do have a question as well. So here, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess the optimization is, is non-convex, but your statement is really just saying, you know, does there exist uh, in the space a solution that corresponds to the global optimum, right? It's, it's not saying that we're gonna guarantee convergence to the global optimum, is that right? Right, right. That's actually a very, yeah, that's a good point. So this statement is just about what is the optimal solution of this objective function. And uh, we're not saying anything about whether you achieve this or not. And in fact, later we'll see that we won't actually look at optimal solution, but we look at epsilon suboptimal solutions in this cross entropy objective, because that's the, that's in some sense the best you can hope for given optimization and like the fact that you only have finite samples. Okay. And, and now for this statement, so I guess F, uh, implicitly kind of defines a space. So here intuitively I would expect something that would suggest that F can span the entire space of distributions. Otherwise there's a risk that uh, I might not have uh, the global, uh, well, the, the true distribution in, in my space. And I don't see any statement about F that would uh, ensure that. So am I missing something? Right. So, yeah. So this is, yeah. Okay. I'll just answer that. So this is perhaps a point that I skimmed over earlier, uh, but there are two points here. One is the fact that this F, the features are restricted to be D dimensional where D is much smaller than V and this already introduces a restriction. But I think the point that you're getting at is F is usually parameterized using a particular model architecture like transformers or yeah. something like, like a recurrent neural network. And what happens if they cannot actually express the this particular f star and that is indeed exactly. true it might not it might not be the case but as i said earlier in in this work we're trying to distill away the factors of what exactly a model architecture can express or what it cannot can we reach it using gradient descent or not all we're saying is okay if, if i could give you uh, an arbitrary function approximator if i could give you an optimization algorithm that could find the minimum what is the best you can hope to do even with that Okay. And even then, because you only use D dimensions, you cannot actually learn P star of S exactly. And this is just a statement about ignoring all those effects. What's the best you can do? Okay. Those, those are really interesting questions. And uh, yeah, I, I will touch upon this point again later. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I, I, we'll see <laughs> if I do. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Uh, this, because... is, this is certainly a very important <laughs> distinction. And thank you for this question. Okay, great. So uh, these are really good questions and they clarified a lot. Uh, so now I'll move ahead from language modeling <clears throat> to downstream task and uh, the sentence completion and reformulation. Okay, so so, so for, for simplicity, assume you just have a binary classification task. Uh, you can extend all of this to K-way classification tasks. But suppose you have the task of sentiment classification for movie reviews. You're given movie reviews with labels either plus one or minus one, denoting whether they were positive or negative. So as I said earlier, language models, we saw that aim to learn P star, the true distribution of words that can follow a context, or at least, at least tries to learn P star on a subspace. Another question is if we are hoping to show guarantees for language models and downstream tasks. 
we should at least be able to say something about the optimal language model and why that's useful before trying to answer it before trying to answer the question of why language models that in practice are at least useful so in other words if we did have access to magically had access to this speech star vectors for a lot of context or for all context can we solve the task a downstream task using that and for that uh, we just do a thought experiment so suppose you have a movie review i would recommend this movie and i give you access to p star which is the true distribution of words that could follow this particular sentence can you think of a way to try to solve this task using p star and uh, if you think about this for some time um i'm sure you would come up with some really smart strategies but one very simple strategy is the one that is described here what you can do is just look at the values of the probabilities that p star would assign let's say to the smile emoticon and the frown emoticon and if you compare the probabilities of the smile emoticon and the sad emoticon uh, uh, actually following this but uh, being the next token or next word after this movie review you can see that this will already give you a pretty good sense of what the sentiment for this movie review was it's unlikely to see a frown emoticon let's say after this movie review even though these emoticons might not be the only words that could follow this movie review when they do occur if you just compare the two probabilities that could give you a sense of what the movie review a uh, sentiment is and i'm just going to rewrite the simple strategy as actually now a linear classifier on top of this vector of probability p star where the linear classifier v here just has a weight of plus 1 on the smile emoticon coordinate minus 1 on the frown emoticon and zero on all other coordinates and now you can see that in some sense once you rephrase it that as this okay what can follow next and compare probabilities you can rewrite this as a linear classifier on top of the vector p star so this is one strategy but can we do better we know that a p star vector contains a lot of words right but can we use a lot more of those words rather than just these two emoticons so what you can do is add a common prompt at the end of all movie reviews so let's say i add additional three words this movie was blank and now i try to use p star vector to predict the sentiment now you see that you can use a larger set of words like good brilliant garbage or boring that are indicative of the sentiment which you couldn't use earlier and perhaps some kind of weighted combination of these probabilities is going to tell you or going to correlate with the sentiment of this movie review where you have positive weights for words uh, that can be positive sentiment and negative weights otherwise and i'm sorry uh, zero weights for words that are irrelevant to sentiment and again you can perhaps uh, write it as a linear classifier on top of p star and in fact there's more there's a more fundamental reason why you can write it as a linear classifier over p star but i won't get into it in case but if someone is interested i'm happy to get into that and now we see that the strategy of adding prompts not only allows us to look at a larger set of words because they would be grammatically correct completions but it also helps us extend this idea to other classification tasks like topic classification as we'll see later in the topic classification task for example uh, you can just add this article is about blank and that can the completions for using p star can help you solve this task so does this actually happen in practice and here we try to verify whether you can solve uh, tasks using the sentence completion intuition whether you can use the probabilities from p star uh, the probability of words that can follow to solve downstream tasks uh, while we tested for a bunch of classification tasks i'm just going to use the standard sst dataset for sentiment classification again of movie reviews and while we do not have access to p star instead what we do is uh, we use the probabilities outputted by a pre trained language model in this case we use gpt language model and we try to solve the downstream task of sst so k here denotes the number of classes which in this case is just two and uh, in the first column what we do is we look at the output probabilities from the language model but just look at two tokens as i described earlier the smile and the frown emoticon and we learn a linear classifier on top of it by using the labeled data in fact you will need just like 10 examples or something to learn a linear classifier because we just using a two dimensional feature now which is just these two probabilities and you see that you can already get up to a performance of 76% and you can actually boost that performance to 79.4 if you if you add a prompt 
uh, if I using the prompt strategy that I described in just in the previous slide. So you can get a boost in performance using the prompt. And then that in some sense is, uh, yeah, okay, I'll get to that later. But you see that you can already get pretty good performance where random performance is 50%. So you're already getting close to 80. In fact, you can do even better if you just, instead of two words, you look at a set of 20 words that we just pick that arbitrary pick that makes sense. Like good, great, boring, bad, etc. And you see that with this 20 dimensional feature now, you can already get up to 83.5. So just for context for what these numbers mean, if you, what you can also do is just use the features f of s that are d-dimensional, when d in this case is 768 dimensions. And without a prompt, you can get 87.6, while with a prompt, you can already get close to 90. So two things here. One is we already see that fixing the features and using them for a downstream task with linear classifi classification already does well, which is what, which was a setting that uh, we gestated ourselves to. And we see that we are not actually too far away, even though 6% is a big gap in the context of random performance in 50-50, it's not that big. And also to see whether this effect is actually just because of some kind of inductive bias, like maybe the model architecture of transformers is just good that it already gives you good performance. We look at the performance of a randomly initialized GPT-2 architecture and use the features on that. And that performance is not much better than the random. So, it, so the good performance here is indeed because the language model learned something meaningful. And again, to give a comparison to a non-language model, but a very classical baseline from NLP, which is the bag of words, where you just uh, look at all the words that are present in the in a sentence and try to take a weighted combination of uh, with where the weights are learned. And that gets a performance of 80.7. While that's not a super strong baseline, you can see that you can just by using a 10, 20 dimensional feature from this language model, which was this, you can get up to 83.5, you can beat it. Furthermore, in all these settings, except for the random uh, initialization, you see that adding a prompt certainly helps, which even more strongly kind of justifies the sentence completion view that if you try to make a sentence more grammatically correct, uh, you get better performance. And actually similar observations have been uh, seen in practice, like this idea of using a prompt after a sentence to ex exploit a language model is actually uh, getting more and more popular these days. Okay, so this slide was just to try to convince you that the sentence completion view, at least for this particular task, holds. Great, so now that we have the sentence completion view behind us, I'm going to describe how you formalize this into math statements uh, and how you can show guarantees for this. Okay, so as I said earlier, the sentence completion and reformulation in some sense was saying that you can solve the task using a linear function of the probability vector P star. And to precisely, uh, to ground what we mean by good performance on linear classification task, we define this metric, the standard metric of lo logistic regression. So given any feature map G, which maps your sentences into D-dimensional features, you define the loss on the task T for the features G. If you use a linear classifier V as the expected logistic loss, if you use this predictor, V transpose the feature. So if you use this linear predictor on top of these fixed features and you measure the logistic regression loss, which is the standard thing that one would do. This is how we measure the performance of any features. And with that in hand, we define what we call tau natural task. So a task is tau natural. If it can, uh, intuitively, if it can be solved well using linear classification over the vector P star, or in other words, if you use P star as a feature, and you look at the best linear classifier V on top of these features, you can get an error of tau. So tau here captures how natural, and natural is the is the short, this is the word that we're using basically to denote how amenable the task is to the sentence completion reformulation that we described earlier. And smaller the value of tau, uh, the more it fits this framework. So we define natural task this way. However, we note, we, we, we observed earlier in the cross entropy case that you cannot actually, may not actually run P star exactly. With language models, if you have word embeddings phi, you can maybe only expect to learn it on the subspace spanned by phi. So you, and, and then, then the question is, what kind of tasks does this sus, subspace span? So define tau natural tasks with respect to this matrix phi as now again using P star as the features for the downstream task, but instead of an arbitrary linear classifier as earlier, 
we restrict the linear classifier to be in the subspace of the word embedding matrix field. And if you can still do well then in this restriction, get error less than tau, then you are tau natural with respect to field. And of course, the next obvious question is, is this subset of tasks? It's clearly a subset of the natural tasks. Is this any interesting? The subspace note that is determined by the word embedding matrix field. And it turns out that, I won't go into the details, but we have some uh, uh, something about this in the paper. So, so if, if your word embedding matrix has nice properties that it assigns similar embeddings to similar words like synonyms, then the subspace will contain more stars of interest. For example, perhaps trying to separate between whether the word good can follow a sentence or the word nice can follow a sentence. This, this is a kind of task that may, you may not be able to solve that may not be part of this natural task with respect to feed as opposed to a task where you're trying to separate between good and bad, let's say. But it's unlikely to see a task where you're doing such fine grained comparisons of like good and great. So this is the kind of intuition you should have. But uh, all we need to know for this talk is that town natural task with respect, respect to fee is a restriction, but not a very huge restriction if the word embedding matrix is nice. Okay, so with all of these tools in hand, we're now ready to present the first main result. And remember that our goal was to answer the following question. Why can language models that do well on the cross entropy objective learn features that are useful for these kind of classification tasks uh, that are solved linearly? Okay, so suppose you have a language model F that is epsilon optimal in cross entropy. I'll get to what epsilon optimality precisely means, but all we know that is, is that you're doing well on the language model in task, but perhaps you're not at the optimality. And as we discussed earlier, you probably won't get to optimality because of multiple issues. And suppose you have a tau natural task P. Again, natural task is one that can be reformulated using the sentence completion view. Then you can show the following bound. So on the left-hand side, you have the logistic regression loss on the task. If you use the output probabilities from the language model as V-dimensional features for the downstream task. And you can say that this is small if two terms are small. If first tau, which is denoting how natural a task is or how amenable it is to sentence completion, plus arguably the more important term, which is O of square root epsilon, which is the loss that you suffer due to the suboptimality of the language model. And the suboptimality here is defined as the cross entropy loss for the language model that you have, minus the cross entropy loss for the true distribution P star. This is the best cross entropy you could have hoped to get if you actually knew the true distribution. And epsilon here denotes that. And in other words, if you're familiar with the concept of perplexity, you can think of epsilon as log of the ratio of the perplexity of your language model to the best perplexity you can hope to get. So if your language model has a perplexity of 30, and let's say the, the true perplexity of natural language is something like 20, then it's something like log 1.5, which is around 0.6. So epsilon is not in the scale of perplexity, but in the log of it. So we just take a closer look of whether this result tries to answer the question that we set out to answer. So first we are looking at language models that do indeed do well on the cross entropy objective. So they are epsilon optimal. You can get at least epsilon close to the optimal cross entropy we could have got. And we show that you can, the features that we extract from the language model here are actually the output probability vector that it outputs for any sentence, which is a V-dimensional feature. And we are showing upper bound for the logistic regression loss, which is basically learning a linear classifier and measuring the logistic loss for tasks that are natural. So at least in some way, we are, we do answer the question that we set out to answer. Except that we are using features that are V-dimensional, which is the vocabulary size, which is of the order of 50 to 100,000. Of course, this is not desirable. And this is also not what we observe in practice. We see that we can actually extract low dimensional features from language models. And the next result is actually a stronger way version of this, which can show guarantees for certain low dimensional features that I'll describe now. So again, if you have an epsilon optimal language model F, but now if you have a task that is only natural with respect to fee, and then as, I, as I said earlier, if fee is nice, assign similar embeddings to synonyms, et cetera, then this is not a big restriction. Then you can show the following guarantee. On the left side, you have the logistic regression, but not just for the probabilities now, but for this new set of D-dimensional features that we call conditional mean features, where you take the output probability vector from the language model, which is V-dimensional and hit it with this D cross V matrix, the word embedding matrix. And you get a D-dimensional feature now. And the performance of, of these features on linear classification for this task 
is again upper bound by tau, which is how natural the task is. Now, plus instead of square root epsilon, you have square root of epsilon minus epsilon star phi. And here we are measuring, we are again measuring the suboptimality for the language model, but not with respect to the true distribution, but only with respect to the best possible softmax language model that uses d dimensional features that you could have done. So here, instead of comparing to cross entropy of p star, you're comparing to cross entropy of p of f star. And in, in some sense, this is the best you can ever hope to do with a language model. You cannot actually get closer to cross entropy of p star because this is the best that any softmax language model could have done if it had arbitrary expressive power and a lot of samples. So this epsilon minus epsilon star phi is indeed a term that you may be with enough samples with an expressive enough model architecture, you can even hope to get to zero. And this result is telling me that that's all you need to do. You don't actually need to hope for learning the true distribution piece there and getting the perplexity as low as that, which is actually an interesting finding. Uh, and uh, while proving the previous result required some st standard tool like Pinsker's inequality, if you're familiar with it, proving this result actually required us to show uh, a d-dimensional variant or a, of the Pinsker's inequality, which was at least as far as we knew uh, was not known. So again, the differences are you're only you're showing guarantees for now d-dimensional features instead of v-dimensional features. And you're also showing stronger guarantees, which is you're suffering not the suboptimality with respect to the true distribution, but only softback models. But you're showing guarantees for this restricted set of tasks, which is the tasks that are natural only with respect to phi. So if you have a better idea of what phi actually is capturing tasks of interest, you can perhaps just use that phi in your language modeling and get these guarantees for phi. So just a closer look at these conditional mean features. Uh, as I said, they are new. This is a new way to extract d-dimensional features, and it naturally shows up in the theory. So you can think of this as a weighted average of the word embeddings, where the weights now for a weight for a word is determined by the probability that is assigned to it by the language model. And uh, this just came popped out of the theory, and so we thought, okay, why not test this and see how well this does, this does in practice? So these were the previous results. And now this is where the conditional mean features fit in. So again, they're d-dimensional, the same as the final features. And you see that they, the, they actually reduce the gap between the probabilities and the features by a lot. And you see that the, the boost that you get in performance due to the prompt is also much higher here than the actual features. And now you're already at 87%. So you're pretty close to the performance of the features that you, you get from the language model directly. And this was kind of surprising to us because we didn't know what to expect from these features and it turned out to do quite well. And in fact, you can do this for other kind of classification tasks as well. So AG News is a task where you have news articles and you're categorizing them into one of four categories, uh, science, politics, so, sorry, science, news, business, and sports. And again, you can add a prompt which says this article is about blank and try to complete it. And this row corresponds to adding a prompt. And the pattern is the same. The probabilities do quite well, much better than a random performance. Conditional mean features are pretty close to the actual features. And you see a huge boost in performance like almost 4.5%, uh, sorry, 3.5% if you add a prompt. And now just for the sake of it, uh, we also saw, okay, let's see if the square root epsilon dependency act, uh, dependence actually shows up in practice. Note that this was just an upper bound. So the upper bound may not always be achieved. There is no lower bound per se, but we just were curious to see if this actually shows up in practice. So we plotted on the x-axis, the cross entropy of the language model that uh, you learn. And on the y-axis, you measure the logistic regression loss on the downstream task for conditional mean features. And this was basically the right-hand side and the left-hand side on the results that we showed above. And you see that you can kind of, it's somewhat of a square root relationship. You can fit a decent enough curve to it, which was again surprising. Even though it's not necessary to see something like this, it showed up in practice. I need to okay, see. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Could there right. be tasks that are difficult to formulate as a sentence completion, but still easy for the language model to solve in other ways, like fine tuning? Right. So that's a very that's a very good question, um, and um, I don't have a great answer right now. But for example, it is common in uh, NLP to have tasks where, for a downstream task, you not just use the existing token, but you add new tokens to the task. For example, if you have a downstream task on a pair of sentences, you will add a separated token between the two sentences. And because the down, because the pre-training did not involve any separated token, let's say, you are forced to learn something, meaning learn that separated token, like what it should denote. 
and in some sense you are forced to fine tune because you need to add this additional machinery and you cannot directly use the language model so in in some sense yeah you, there are definitely tasks where the, where you need to fine tune but we don't know if those are the best ways maybe best ways maybe there is another way to reformulate it uh, and we just don't know it so it's an interesting question even to try to understand what can you do without fine tuning whereas what can you for what do you definitely need fine tuning and uh, it's there's no clear answer and i think that's a very good interesting question to try to answer though okay thanks so quickly as this is the main takeaways from the results and from the experiments uh the, first we saw that classification task at least many of them can be reformulated as sentence completion which in turn implies that you can solve it using a linear classifier over the true distribution of words this vector p star and then using that you can formulate that as natural task and then show guarantees for epsilon optimal language models that they will do suffer an extra square root epsilon due to the suboptimality sorry an important point that i'll do i would want to reemphasize is that we saw that softflex models can only hope to learn p star on a subspace that is spanned by the word embedding matrix field it is possible that you can learn p star exactly if all the all your distributions p star can be expressed as softmax using these word embeddings but you don't know that know that for sure you don't even know if any if any such low dimensional structure exists and you don't even know if the matrix phi that you have does have that structure but what you can hope to show is learn p star on a subspace spanned by the word embeddings and thus in some sense your word embeddings phi could determine what tasks that like your language models can help with and uh, as, as i said earlier we get a good intuition, intuition out of this that it's good to assign similar embeddings to synonyms this is like a kind of nice property that you would want your phi to have so although i we didn't touch upon this here Uh, another important question is what is the optimal word embedding set optimal solution phi star for the language model learning objective if you learn both and this is actually an open problem because it's not as clear the answer for this is as not as clear as the answer is for the embedding function perhaps you learn a phi star that automatically learns good directions but we don't exactly know and that's i think another in, uh, interesting open direction and the other uh, inside i would say is that of conditional mean features so it gives you a new way to extract three dimensional features that does well in practice and also has theoretical guarantees so it gives you a tool to be able to perhaps manipulate these kind of models that use across entropy objective and potentially can be useful for other models and other tasks as well so probably good to keep in mind so there are other extensions in the paper that we have for example um as i said the as you saw in the results the features typically always did better than the conditional mean features and in the paper we can actually experimentally verify some assumptions about the word embeddings and prove a linearity linear relation between these two dimensional embeddings and we see that this linearity holds weakly in practice as well but it's still the mystery as to why f of s always outperforms the conditional mean features and i think that's also an interesting question although there are some intuitions it's not clear mathematically why that should be the case Uh, we also use the insights to design the new objective function which which is like an alternative to the cross entropy objective again the goal was not to obtain state of the art results but it was to see whether the insights can be useful to do some objective design and the new objective that we had does reasonably well in practice though still slightly worse than the cross entropy objective but it has nice mathematical properties like for this for this objective unlike the cross entropy you can actually show a closed form expression for the optimal word embedding matrix as well along with the optimal feature map and in fact you can prove uh, like you can show that the 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 solution for phi star actually has a nice property that it will respect synonyms that is it assigns similar embeddings to to words that are synonyms and by synonyms here i'm treating synonyms as uh, the ones that synonyms on in the context of the distributional hypothesis where words that tend to occur in a similar context are going to be synonyms and you see that this property nicely shows up in the optimal word embedding and also you have the nice property that the features are linear functions of phi star again and uh, while i described uh, i hid all the constants in these bounds the constants actually also give some more intuitions or capture some more intuitions like the, the constants for example show that transfer between uh, the performance the, the transfer of the suboptimal downstream task is better if a task depends on the larger set of words rather than a smaller set of words which kind of also explains why using a prompt is better than um, not using a prompt and also it's better if the sentence distribution for a downstream task is closer to the language modeling sentence distribution and this is kind of 
probably not that surprising, but at least it's good to be able to quantify this in a bound. So as for future work, there is a lot of interesting directions and this is just scratching the surface. Uh, we covered some of them already uh, through the talk, but I'm going from the lowest level to the highest level. So at a low level, we still don't understand why the features do better than conditional mean features as I described earlier. And it would be interesting to understand why. Furthermore, uh, we are very interested in understanding if this insights can be extended to other kind of uh, bi-directional and masked language models, as opposed to just an autoregressive model, language model that we looked at here. So in fact, you can actually extend the theory to the case where, let's say, in a model like BERT, um, you just mask one token. So in BERT, you typically also use the future information to predict a token and also mask a few tokens in order to predict any given token. However, when you mask multiple tokens, it becomes kind of unclear because there's no masking of tokens happening in the downstream task. So there is this mismatch. And how do you handle this? Does it give you anything additional benefit? What benefit is it providing in terms of bounds or like what term is it trying to minimize? And then maybe you can exploit that and do that better. So these, these questions are quite interesting. And of course, we would. this was just for classification tasks. Can we extend the insights, either the insights of like sentence completion view uh, or the fact that you try to avoid fine tuning and see what you can do with that. And perhaps also try to use the tools from this, like maybe something like condition mean features or looking at optimal solutions, like some really basic uh, simple first steps that you can try to do for any of these tasks. And I think that's really interesting and, 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 and important as well. And of course, at the high level, understanding the role of fine tuning and inductive biases. So, so as I alluded to earlier, um, we don't exactly know the answer to these questions, even for like shallow deep, uh, sh shallow neural networks. And so it's tough to answer, but I think we can perhaps do some kind of ex empirical exploration. For example, what kind of functions can transform our architecture express? Maybe it cannot express all functions, but maybe it can express functions. Uh, maybe it can express functions if a data has some nice structure. And uh, I think this requires a lot of empirical exploration to try to see what properties do pre-trained language models satisfy, apart from just the, the low level signal that, okay, it has small cross entropy or it has low perplexity. I think these models don't just have that. They have some other nice properties that are either induced because of the architecture or the algorithm. And I think that's important to have some balance of like empirical, ex empirical exploration and theoretical insights to try to understand this better. Yeah, so that's basically all I wanted to present. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now and feel free to shoot me an email if you want to discuss anything or if you have any questions even after the talk. And I've just added the link to the paper on archive. So thanks, uh, thanks Nikuj. I think there's a question in the chat, uh, which I think is uh, you went over in the last slide, but uh, can you generalize this work to other pre-training tasks, for example, mass language modeling or next sentence prediction from John? Right, so yeah, I, I touched upon this point earlier. Uh, and that is indeed an important question. Uh, so as I said earlier, with mass language modeling, there is this mismatch that while pre-training you mask tokens and in downstream tasks you do not. Is that masking necessary? What does it help you with exactly? These are the kinds of questions that we don't really have an answer to and we are actually currently pursuing this direction. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there, are, there are some promising answers that we need to test, but yeah, I think that's important. For something like next, sen uh, next sentence prediction, I, I see next sentence prediction as in some sense similar to let's say contrastive learning where you try to embed a sentence and the next sentence and then you try to make their embeddings also similar uh, in some way. And in fact, um, so, we, uh, so we have worked on uh, understanding contrastive learning also from a theoretical perspective and that's quite related to next, word, uh, next sentence prediction. So there is some existing understanding for why they do well but it's still not clear. It's also not clear how, um, let's say, the problem of next word prediction versus something like next sentence prediction or contrast learning, how do they gel in together? Like what happens when you do both of them? So these kind of questions are not very easy to answer. And I think, uh, as I also said earlier, I think it requires some combination of uh, like, like trying to do some experiments, very uh, precise experiments by controlling certain parameters and then seeing if that changes some uh, and using theoretical insights to guide these experiments perhaps and seeing what properties can you extract out of this but yeah these are definitely uh, i think important questions and i think 
we are still at the surface like at trying to understand uh, understand all of these so i guess a, a quick follow up um do you view uh, a lot of the recent work with i guess the multitask uh architectures like t5 as uh kind of targeting that tau um and and trying to uh you know um by having a diversity of tasks uh sort of uh lower in tau uh in your decomposition right so yeah so um i don't quite remember the details for t5 exactly but uh this idea of like treating nlp tasks as all similar in some sense um so there were there, there has been, there have been actually earlier work that um if if um, i'm blanking on i think it was nlp decathlon or something that basically try to rephrase all tasks as a question answering task and then train a language train a model that basically solves a bunch of these tasks in a multitask fashion uh so thinking of all tasks in a similar view actually was kind of the inspiration for uh us trying to look at this even so uh i'm not sure if that's necessarily the necessarily the right direction because it's difficult to answer what's the right direction at this point theory is not uh that far yet but i mean as of now whatever works well in practice is the right direction but certainly uh doing things both theory and experiments in a more principled manner where you try to combine things together into one view um and uh, even with language models there is this view of trying to add some prompts priming a language model in a particular way and solving multiple tasks in in a similar way all of this if nothing it enables us to understand the problem better uh and apart from the other practical benefits that it gives you more data and uh, like you can train all these tasks combined uh, so i would say at least from a theoretical point of view it definitely helps to understand and to see that this kind of rephrasing of tasks into one view does well uh empirically of course i think whatever does better is better but yeah i think in in terms of understanding i think that definitely helps uh okay great so we i think we're out of time so uh yeah nikunj uh, you have uh, the email address uh, and then yeah you feel free to uh, forward any questions to nikunj directly and uh yeah so let's let's end it here thank you so much nikunj for a great presentation and thanks for your time and uh yeah. and thanks everyone for attending yeah thanks right for uh inviting and thank you everyone for joining uh, i hear it's still not the semester has not yet begun so uh i appreciate all of you joining and asking these questions thank you so much yeah thank you everyone have a nice weekend bye